This Marquee Dragon video is sponsored by Shattered Crystal, game codes, and items. Hello, Marquee Dragon, also known as Marcus Eikenberry in real life. And today is part eight of a series that was inspired by Nicholas Patterson, who is a PhD candidate at Deakin University in Australia. And he is studying for his PhD in virtual property theft. If it sounds like I'm having a little bit of trouble talking today, it's because maybe I am. It's 11 degrees where I'm at right now, and I'm a little bit cold. <laughs> Just getting all of this camera stuff set up. Yeah, I'm already cold. So what I've got behind me here, this is Black Butte and I am in the Deschutes National Forest. And uh, these trees back here, these are ponderosa pines. And uh, if you look closely, you'll see that a lot of them uh, have been burned pretty badly. Uh, there was a fire that went through here a couple years ago that was enormous, and uh, it, uh, it took out a lot of trees out here. But um, of course, everything is recovering as normal. Anyway, I'm out here at sunrise today, and that's how I've got such great lighting, I didn't have to bring lights with me. Anyway, let's get down to what Nicholas asks, and this is part eight, and um, this one, this is kind of a long one. So, if given a chance to address the user base of a virtual world, do you personally have any recommendations on how they could stop their virtual property from being stolen? Well, that's kind of a, an interesting question because in uh, most of the games, they don't allow virtual property be, to be traded for real world, anything that has real world value. But in the case of, uh, you know, well, people do it anyway. And uh, so now I know Nicholas is, is going at this is not as like a thief skill in the game. But we're talking about stuff that has real-world value that may be uh, traded, bought, or sold external of the, um, of the game mechanics. So there's uh, several things to help you from keep from getting your stuff stolen. And uh, this is really a far-reaching question because uh, there is in-game safety, and then there is the question of uh, trading externally. And in game, most of the most of the stuff is addressed with in game mechanics. Like uh, in Ultima Online, there was the thief skill. In uh, Eve Online, there is the um, I don't know if there are actual skills in the game, but there is a lot of corporate espionage and thievery that goes on in there. Occasionally it makes the news to where you hear about these, you know, 100 billion isk stolen. Um, in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the most recent ones was, uh, I think it's called Somer Blink. It's their lottery. And one of their own guys took off with uh, some of the, some of the uh, money and product that they held for the lottery. And now they were very smart because they, they knew that they didn't have control of each individual item and they really needed the help of multiple people. And so they put everything together uh, so that they distributed the risk. And the, uh, so I, I'm not sure how many people uh, Seth, who runs the site, has uh, helping him out. But uh, it, uh, he had it distributed far enough that when that did happen and this uh, person who was working with them took off with a whole bunch of ISK and, and product, uh, that when they did that, uh, they were still okay. And uh, they continued on business as normal. Um, but uh, in fact, I'll include a link to them in the description of this because their, um, their kind of business model in the game is is pretty amazing. Uh, it's a lottery thing, but they pay out with uh, currency in the game and they pay out with product. So they pay out with like ships and stuff. And while I don't play the game, so I don't fully understand what it is they're doing, 
I can see though that they've got something that's really popular and really of interest to a lot of people. And with the high dollars or high uh, ISK count that they show on their page for what they've paid out, you know that they have some very large volumes of uh, currency and other items that have worth uh, in their accounts. And so it uh, uh, would be a big target. And uh, that's something that I'm sure Seth is grappling with. And, and maybe, maybe I'll get a chance to interview him someday and we'll talk about uh, how his security is for that. Uh, but I do know right now he's using a distributed method. So if one thing gets hit, he keeps moving on because he's okay. So stopping the, the product from actually being stolen, that's a lot harder. And um, you know, in the case of, of Seth with uh, the Blink site, um, you know, there, there's, there's not, you know, it, 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 gosh, I'm kind of tongue-tied for words because uh, there will be theft. And so what you do is when you have no way to stop uh, particular th types of theft from happening, then uh, you end up in a case of needing to uh, build it into your business plan and build in the fact that, yes, theft is going to happen and um, there's nothing you can do about it. So you factor in with your profit enough to cover your losses. And that is, that's not a way to stop it, but that's a way to address it. Now, to totally stop it would be to not trade or interact with other players. And that's very hard to do. <laughs> and, you know, it, it really, it can defeat the purpose of, of many games to, to not do that. But in cases where the, um, the product that you have, that you have for sale, is um, going to be something that's going to be exchanged or traded for real world currency, then uh, you need to use a method that is um, proactive, not reactive. So proactive is to, well, let me, let me first address reactive and why it's the wrong way. So reactive is where you do something after the fact, after uh, you've taken the loss. And that is really not a very good uh, way of doing things because um, y you, you can't get the stuff back. You don't have the powers necessary to address the problem uh, after the fact. Uh, the game companies are going to laugh at you if you try and get something back. Now, in, in the case of like, you know, when your account is hacked and stuff like that, that's a little bit different because the different game companies address that different ways. But when you're buying, selling, and trading, uh, if it's for real world cash, uh, they're gonna laugh you out of the park because that is 100% on you. If you are doing stuff that uh, is within the game mechanics, well then they've allowed the game mechanics to do it. And so uh, it's part of the game. And it's not something that you can, uh, uh, that you can make a petition for to correct. It just doesn't work that way. So the proactive part, um, in, in game, uh, it's smart to, you know, the different games work different ways, but I'll give you an example in Ultima Online. In Ultima Online, when we were trading stuff, we had this problem that um, multiple characters could have the exact same name. Now, most every game that's out nowadays does not have that. Uh, it's, it's almost always a unique name unless you're on a different server. But in Ultima Online, you could have multiple characters named Marky Dragon. And when we were doing brokering, we would have these imposters that would show up at the bank. And they, we used to do stuff like, we used to take uh, gold in exchange for game time codes. And uh, so we would take the gold and then we would uh, send them through ICQ or an email, uh, a game time code in exchange for the gold that they gave us. And then we would take the gold and we would sell it on eBay. And we would double our money each time. And, and that was just one of our business uh, things that we did. And, uh, but there'd be imposters that would sit in the bank named Marky Dragon. And they would stand there and say, oh, here I am. 
you know, just every few minutes or whatever. And somebody might run up and say, oh yeah, here I am, here's the gold. I look forward to getting my game time coat. And then they'd disappear and then we'd show up and they'd be going, what happened here, you know? The, uh, I can't tell you how many times we got messages from people saying, why did you scam me? Well, the answer is we didn't. Uh, the answer is, is that you got scammed by someone else that looked like us. Now, we, what we did in prevention for that is that we required a couple of things. One is, is that we required them to contact a very specific ICQ number. And then we would send them a passphrase and we would say something like, um, you know, I'm going to say, got gold? as my question whenever I walk up to you. And that was gonna be like the passphrase for them knowing that that character in the game was us. And uh, so, or we did things like, we had items that were, that were marked for, um, we had some like special clothing which had our name like sewn into it and people could look at the properties of it and see that. And uh, that was a one-time event and so, um, we use that as identification. Now, uh, people still got scammed sometimes because, you know, the, the thieves are very clever. And so it, uh, uh, you know, it's always a cat and mouse and sometimes it's the mouse chasing the cat <laughs> type of thing. Now in uh, real world dollars, uh, you need to do several things. And this is one of the functions that Trust2 provides for Shatter Crystal and for several other stores uh, and for several game publishers. And this is where Trust2, and I'll just call it we, us, we go and we verify the identity of each individual customer the first time that they interact with us. And then we sometimes re-identify them when they interact with us again if the um, if conditions change. And I'm not going to go a whole lot into how exactly we do it, but um, what we do is we make sure that we know who we are dealing with. We make sure that the person that we're dealing with actually owns the payment method that they're using. And so if they're using a credit card or they're using a PayPal account or whatever, we verify that they're the ones who own that account and that that account is, um, is they're authorized to use it and stuff. And in the cases of even stuff like, uh, sometimes we, we do turn away people because like it's a husband using a wife's account, but we don't, the wife isn't available to speak to. It's really hard for us to accept payments like that because it's, um, it kind of violates our own internal protection policies. And so we're very stringent on it. And in fact, um, at like Shatter Crystal, sometimes we call the store a club. And uh, we call it a club because it is, uh, not everybody makes it in. In fact, we turn away probably 5% of customers and our potential customers. And of those, about two and a half percent are people who are scamming, who are attempting to fraud us. And uh, the other two and a half percent are actual, real, honest customers. But for whatever reason, we have not been able to accurately identify that they are the owner of the payment method they're trying to use. And uh, we may offer them other things. Now, uh, some, some other secure payment methods, Western Union. And uh, Western Union is something that uh, if you have somebody send you a payment via Western Union, you go there, you pick up the cash, you've got it. There's only one time in my life that I heard of a Western Union being reversed. And um, that was kind of a, an extreme case. Uh, it was part of a big theft ring and Western Union took a lot of losses and they attempted to um, reverse a lot of stuff and basically they were told to go to hell because they advertise that they're secure uh, and that's why they were being used and because that way we didn't have to worry about the fraud 
because Western Union did that. Now, Western Union also charged them quite a bit of money to send money. And so that's how they kind of like insured their transactions. So uh, prevention is key. You can't, you can't be reactive. And, uh, you know, in a, in a nutshell on the prevention portion, basically you identify that the person who's sending you the money, that you know their identity, and that the payment method they're using, that they are uh, the owner of it. Not just authorized for it, because they can tell you that they're authorized, but that they are actually the owner of it. So now there's some other parts to this question here. Um, so, part A. How effective do you feel uh, your recommendations would be? Well, I can tell you that uh, if you were to use Trust2 to do all of your transactions, you would be 100% effective because Trust2 ensures all the transactions for you and uh, guarantees you no more than a 1% loss. And um, 1% is actually a very low number. Uh, if you were to... Um, do it yourself, or actually, let me just give an example. I won't tell you any game company names, but um, I'll tell you that multiple game companies have come to us saying that they've had 50% losses. And help, <laughs> because 50%, my God, you can't, uh, I mean, even if you're manufacturing the product yourself and it's virtual bits and bytes and it doesn't uh, cost you a whole lot to do it, the um, fees from all the chargebacks and everything, the penalties uh, and the fines, that, that just kill you. So <laughs> um, now on your own, you can be very smart about it. There, there are some guides out there that talk about how to safely accept PayPal. And uh, PayPal is a pretty good uh, way to go. Um, I would say that you can be with PayPal and being reasonably sure that every customer, uh, every person that you're accepting money from is authorized to use that payment method, uh, that it's their account, I would say that you can get your fraud rate down to about 5% as, as an individual. Um, another way to do it would be through eBay. eBay offers some protections, but they don't offer protections against virtual goods. And so that, you know, that's kind of a hard area to do. Uh, and in fact, in PayPal, uh, they don't offer you protection against virtual goods as well. They actually um, say that they don't offer any buyer or seller protection. And so if uh, you could be screwed on uh, something you sell and uh, lose it. So I, I think that you can, you can do pretty good. Um, there's, there's, there's a couple of things out there that I've, I've written. There's some um, there are some articles out there which uh, I've written, and maybe I'll throw up a link or two if I can find them. It's been quite a while since I wrote them. Um, and then, um, you know, if, you, if you're a business and uh, you need help, um, you can contact us because Trust2 can uh, help you out or Shadow Crystal. So... Uh, let's see, A part two. Uh, where do you feel the crux of the problem lies with theft of virtual property? Part of the problem is that, is just what I just explained about PayPal saying that they don't, um, they don't have any buyer or seller protection for intangible goods. So as a seller, if you get taken and you try and file a claim saying the, you know, the funds were reversed, but I delivered the product. The very first question that you get asked is where is, or, or let us see the signature of delivery. And when they ask for the signature of delivery, they're talking um, the postal service, you know, like signature delivery. They're talking UPS uh, signature required, FedEx signature required. And that is what they want from um, for you to provide. And basically you do that by providing them with the shipping tracking number. And then they're able to go and verify that there was an actual signature and they'll cover it up to certain dollar amounts. Now the problem is, is that 
how do you, when you're selling a sword to somebody in a game, or you're selling currency, or you're selling a game time code, like Shattered Crystal does, how do you prove that that was delivered? Fact is, you don't. You can argue all you want about uh, the, the fact that you delivered it. And some people say, okay, so uh, in the game, I'm delivering this particular item. And so I'm gonna record it with fraps. I'm gonna take screenshots. I'm gonna get them to say their name on screen. I'm gonna get them to say that they received it. I'm gonna get them to send me an email saying they received it. I'm gonna do all this other stuff. The problem is none of that is tangible. All of that can be faked, and PayPal can't tell whether or not you actually interacted with the proper person. They just can't tell. I mean, you can't ask PayPal to do an investigation in a game. Um, they're just not going to do it. Um, you know, maybe one of these days, some of the games will come up with mechanics to secure the delivery. Um, Example is EA's, their, their, uh, in Ultima Online, their account transfer system. Um, and, you know, or let's just take an example that a lot of us are familiar with, World of Warcraft. In World of Warcraft, wouldn't it be cool if you could have your PayPal account tied to your game account? And so when you do a trade with somebody in the game, somebody then can... Um, you know, interact with their PayPal account and send a payment to Blizzard. And then that payment is held in like an escrow. And then from there, they get into the game and they're like given a token in the game or something, something that can be traded in the trade window, in the secure trade window. And so they, they make sure it's you in the game, you guys do the trade, and then you, um, you know, you hand over that token and then you, as the receiver of that, you take that token and you cash it in with the system and the money goes to your PayPal account minus a fee that Blizzard charges for doing the transaction, which would be something around 25 or 30 percent, I would imagine. And wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be uh, something that a lot of people would find of value? Now, there's the proponents on both sides. I know I'm getting a little bit off track here, but there is both sides of this that say, some of them say that RMT, real money trade, is evil. And others say it's great. Now, all these free-to-play games, they are, uh, they're RMT. Really, they are. They, they are, you are, except you're not dealing with a third party um, or a secondary market, you're dealing with the first market, the primary market, the actual game publisher. There's no, not really any difference, except for the fact that they're manufacturing the product that they're selling, and uh, people in the secondary market are, say, creating it in the game, um, or getting it after the game company has manufactured it, and then transferring it over. So, uh, something like that could be a really good solution. So the last part of this is, do you feel uh, there should be real-world laws to assist with criminal prosecution of virtual property thieves? Okay, so uh, let me uh, state this, I guess, in a couple of parts. Um, if the virtual theft happens 100% in the game, 100%, meaning they logged in with their character and they perpetrated the theft in the game just using the game mechanics that are supplied. No, not at all. That is part of the game. Thievery is a important part of mini games, and that should be allowed. Now, when it comes to real-world money and real-world losses, yes, there should be criminal charges for this kind of uh, activity. And th the problem is, is that many of the... Uh, okay, so right now, if I'm in Oregon, which is where I'm at here in the Deschutes National Forest, uh, in Oregon, if someone stole from me over the internet virtual product, and they're in my same state, I can go after them civilly, and I could file police report. 
And I could do that with, uh, if it was local to me, I could file it with my local police. If it was um, within the state, I could file it with the state police. Now, if I go across, if, if we go across state lines, like let's just say that we're just going just a little bit north up to Washington. And uh, so we've crossed the state line. So now it becomes a federal thing. And I would have to get the FBI involved. Now, uh, you guys have heard my story about the FBI, and you have to take an enormous amount of losses in order to uh, actually get the attention from the FBI on this. So, um, it, that's, that's one of the problems right now, is, is the fact that, that you can't, um, that it's really difficult to cross the state lines and prosecute. And, and, it's, and it's not because it's not against the law, because it already is against the law, but it's because the court system um, or the legal system is already bogged down with bigger cases than yours. <laughs> so uh, then let's take it even to a further extreme. Uh, how about the case uh, where I had another video where I talked about where we took $13,000 in losses from one person. That person happened to be in Australia. In fact, Nicholas, if you want to go look somebody up for me, that would be really cool. <laughs> they were in Australia, and this was a case of friendly fraud. This is, um, you know, even, even we make mistakes. And uh, this was a case of, of the, uh, a child, uh, an adult child. He was like 17 or 18. Uh, he... Uh, faked being his father, he got his father's ID, he got his father's credit card and everything, and he did $21,000 worth of purchases over six months. Now you may think that that's an outrageous number. Um, we have people who have spent $100,000 on a single game. So it's not, uh, not that outrageous, but at those volumes we're careful with those people, but we got taken by them. And so the fact is, is that because they're in Australia and because we're in the United States, uh, the cost of, of pursuing this would be extremely high. And I don't know what the legal system is like in Australia and whether or not $13,000 would even make the bottom of the pile like the problems I had here in uh, the United States with... Um, $2,400 or $2,800 worth of losses, um, not even making the bottom of their pile because it was $10,000 then, and it's probably like $100,000 these days. So uh, that, is, that, that is a problem, and that is something, Nicholas, that if you can come up with a solution on that, a um, couple of things. One is, is you should get some sort of prize or award for that. And the second is that a solution like that may be able to be monetized, which could make you very wealthy. So something to think about. Uh, something that I personally would have a very high interest in, in figuring out a solution to that, because it would be of large value to us. We would pay a small portion of every transaction if we could have some sort of insurance on our transactions, and we can. The problem is, is that to insure our transactions, um, we have to pay sometimes more than the profit that we make because the insurance companies are very leery of it as well. And then, just think about this, about insurance companies getting into your stuff, into your business practices, and telling you how you should sell and what kind of customers you can sell to. I think you'd be pretty hamstrung by that. So... Uh, Nicholas, great questions, and uh, so this is it for part nine, and uh, we'll see where I end up next. Probably going to be somewhere in this area in the flipping cold weather, and uh, I'm Marky Dragon. Everybody take care. See you on the next one.